and you were going to the moon. So my first question for you is, as the crew physician, what will you pack? And so in order to know what you're packing for space, it helps to know what the environment is like. And so how do we decide that? Well, at a very, very, very top level, we can look at approaches to survival. For example, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and start with the base survival, food, shelter, water, um, warmth. Of course, this being 2021, let's be real. <laughs> There's probably a more fundamental aspect of the pyramid. I know I wouldn't survive without Wi-Fi. But more seriously, let's talk about the threats of the space flight environment. This is just a laundry list of every possible hazard that you can face in the space flight environment. Everything from increased radiation, which we'll talk about more in depth with these slides from now, to acceleration, deceleration loads associated with launch. The big thing that everyone talks about when it comes to space, which is microgravity, or as we talk about going to the moon, altered gravity, partial gravity, altered day-night cycles. So on the moon, um, this is, or sorry, on the, on the International Space Station, a 24 hour period of day and night actually gets shifted to 16 sunset sunrise cycles every 90 minutes. So that is a 24 hour period. You're actually going through a sunrise sunset cycle every 90 minutes. Um, confined spaces. So you, that this is where that crew dynamics and you know being a good teammate and engaging in good expeditionary behavior really becomes important because no one wants be, to become that guy or gal that's voted off the space station. Um, there's a risk of decompression sickness um, when we go on EVA. So that's why uh, astronauts perform pre-brief protocols, cycle ergometry before they go out on the spacewalk. Uh, your resource limited, your remote, we'll talk about that. There's the challenges of the vacuum of space. Uh, um, and then there's just the risk of everything else that you would encounter in daily life on Earth, from but lumps and bumps and abrasions to... Um, you also want to rely on your life support system to provide you with that clean atmosphere, um, to scrub the atmosphere of any volatile compounds that may come from off-gassing. So this is just a very brief overview. But let's talk a little bit more about some of these challenges. So like I said, when we talk, when most people think about space, we think of microgravity, what we colloquially refer to as zero gravity. Um, and so the bottom line is that every single bodily system is affected by microgravity, whether we're talking about decreased bone density, um, reflecting an osteopenic or osteoporotic state. So we know now that this doesn't plateau and that the risk of bone loss is on average 1.5% per month. Um, and so if you're offloading a, your bones for long duration in space flight, say you take a six to nine month journey to Mars, by the time you will arrive on Mars, um, realizing that your bones are now brittle and that you probably lost muscle mass as well, now you're expecting your crew to perform meaningful work on the surface of Mars. You're also now at increased risk of um, fragility, fracture, fragility fractures. So um, we're losing bone density, muscle mass, they're their fluids distribution in our bodies is affected. So we can expect an upwards fluid shift. This means we're more at risk for developing um, kidney stones. Uh, we see every single aspect of the uh, cardiovascular central nervous system affected. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the upcoming slides, but uh, briefly, um, this upward fluid shift means that our barrel receptors are interpreting this as increased fluid in our bodies. We're urinating, excreting out more fluid in the first few days on station, um, where uh, actually I'll go to the next slide. So with this increased upward shift, you can see that we're also developing this moon face. So this is Dr. Chaki Mukai, JAXA astronaut physician. You can see her in 1G on the left. You can see her normal facial features. And then after um, experiencing fluid shift, you can see that she's experiencing the moon face, very aptly named. And so you can see that with this fluid shift, her facial features are more swollen and rounded. Practically speaking, this actually translates into um, increased sinus congestion. And so you feel like you have a cold in space. And when you're trying to um, eat uh, food in space, it loses its usual flavor. So practically speaking, this translates into needing food that's more flavorful, more textured, um, something that you'll actually want to eat when you don't have traditional uh, guest station. Um, in addition, with this fluid shift, as you can see that you with the you you also get this chicken-like kind of syndrome because again, your fluid normally in your 
legs by virtue of being in 1G is shifting upwards. And so this actually also puts astronauts at risk for orthostatic hypotension in the post-landing state. And the surprises keep coming. So what we know as of the past 12 to 15 years is this fluid shift in microgravity, um, particularly in uh, astronauts who have been in uh, on station um, for more than 30 days. So what we call long duration space flight are more at risk for developing the space adaptation neuroocular syndrome. So this is a fancy way of saying that as part of this whole fluid shift phenomenon, we're seeing the, the cerebrospinal fluid, that brain and, and spinal juice that bathes our CNS, central nervous systems, um, result in increased upward, increased shift um, of the CSF, increased pressure on the brain and also on the ocular system, resulting in um, increased venous lymphatic CSF drainage, as well as uh, flattening of the globe, increased choroidal flows, uh, full increased um, pressure on the optic nerve, uh, resulting in optic nerve edema. And what we see, particularly in male astronauts, is that this can result in um, hyperopia or visual changes. And speaking of gender differences, so we know that male astronauts are the ones who are prone to suffering from ocular syndrome from 30 days in space flight. There are other known gender differences. So we talked about being prone to orthostatic hypotension or fainting post-flight. So when we see the astronauts um, being carried out of the Soyuz capsule, they've landed, they're receiving the hero's welcome. Part of it is receiving the hero's welcome. Part of it is simply not wanting to faint after being in space, being decompensated, um, and just not trying to stand up uh, once being in the 1G environment. And so we know that female astronauts are more prone to the orthostatic intolerance. Females, due to the shorter distance between the urinary tract uh, or the shorter distance of the urethra, are more prone to urinary tract infections in space. We know that there's no differences in psychology or performance amongst the two gen or amongst the genders. Um, and then we, you know, there, this is just simple quick and dirty overview. We haven't even talked about the um, space flight adaptation syndrome, um, the first 72 hours of potentially getting very sick on station because now we have that mismatch between what our eyes are seeing, what our inner ear and vestibular systems are interpreting, and what our proprioceptors are, are perceiving our, our body and space to be. And so this is why we don't schedule anything um, critical like a spacewalk within the first week on station. And data is continually emerging. Despite us having decades of data from human spaceflight, from Gemini, Mercury, Skylab, Mirror, and ISS, we are continually refining what we know about the um, about humans in space. So this is a snapshot of the, the NASA twin study: Scott Kelly, Mark Kelly, identical twins, Navy pilots, NASA astronauts. Scott spent a year in space, Mark spent a year on Earth, and it was a very multidisciplinary study looking at everything from the macro level cognition performance to the micro level DNA methylation, proteomics, meta metabolomics. Um, and some things were surprising, some things weren't. So there were changes, for example, in the gut microbiome. And Scott, for example, was found to uh, eat better in space. He had a gut microbiome that changed while he was in space and then post-flight uh, returned to his original microbiome. Uh, there were changes in um, DNA uh, telomere length. So some of you may know that telomeres are associated with aging and telomere shortening is uh, representative of uh, early of, of aging and Scott's telomeres were found to lengthen in space. Um, so this is just a fancy way of saying we know a lot, but we're still learning more. Um, here's another example of the surprises that keep coming. So in 2019, as recently as two years ago, uh, this is a publication. So astronauts were performing handheld ultrasounds um, of the ju their jugular veins on station. And then lo and behold, this is one of those check your pulse moments that Shana was talking about. They visualized a giant thrombus in the jugular vein of one of the astronauts. And so now we have to ask ourselves, has space been making us hypercoagulable this entire time? Are we more prone to clotting in space? So that particular um, the astronaut was treated with uh, low molecular weight heparins. And now the question is, well, what does this mean for long duration spaceflight? Who is prone to clots? How does this affect our screening? So the surprises keep coming. And if you remember nothing else from this part of the talk, this introduction, it's that 
space is trying to kill you. And that's just low Earth orbit. So all of this data that we've talked about has been from being relatively close to Earth, approximately 400 kilometers, 250 miles from the vicinity of the Earth's surface. So what happens when we go beyond low Earth orbit? This isn't simply a theoretical question. We are planning to go to the moon and beyond. This is NASA's exploration roadmap, looking at the moon as a proving ground with the Artemis missions and eventually hopefully getting humans to Mars. Um, this is, so how are we getting to the moon? This is the gateway concept. So by the middle of this decade, we will have uh, non-continuously crewed options with crews of, uh, I believe it's three to four, um, with, uh, being on station with a view towards performing Earth observation, lunar observation, solar observation, and astronomy, serving as a way station between a waypoint between um, the Earth and the lunar surface, um, and then hopefully paving for Artemis, the first woman and next man on the moon. And so by the end of this decade, we hope to establish so as early as 2024, depending on timeline, we could see the first woman on the moon. And then by the end of this decade could perform or could establish permanent surface operations on the moon for exploration, science, um, mining, and more. And then using the lessons learned from the moon, hopefully use the moon as a test bed for going forward to Mars. So this isn't just a theoretical question to say, well, what happens to the human body and how do the hazards change when we go beyond low Earth orbit? It, it's not just the governmental space agencies, it's not just the public sector. The, those of you who follow the commercial sector know that Elon Musk has famously said, we're gonna put humans on Mars um, within the next decade. And so we know this, we know that from decades, or hundreds of pages of documentation from the biomedical lessons from Apollo that the, you know, there are very real risks related to, for example, lunar regolith. We know that um, the amount of lunar dust was skin irritant, respiratory irritant, clogged of the joints in the EVA suit. Uh, we know that radiation, the further out we go, becomes more of a concern. So even on ISS, a single day on ISS is equivalent to 250 times the ground exposure radiation that you would get on Earth. Um, and the further out you go, the less protection you have from the magnetosphere and the Van Allen belts. So now once you're beyond the Van Allen belts, you suddenly have to worry about um, galactic cosmic rays, higher energy uh, radiation, solar particle events, um, and then of course the time delay. So um, the further, oh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, so briefly talking about the risks of radiation, um, every single one of our bodily systems and tissues is, is at risk um, from everything from acute radiation sickness, chronic radiation sickness, cataract formation, uh, cancer, um, damage to blood forming organs. And that's why we have yearly exposure limits and career limits when it comes to radiation exposure. And you can see, for example, on MIR, um, there was a, the blood forming organ lim annual limit is 0.5 sieverts. This was exceeded on um, uh, a MIR mission. Speaking of time delays, so depending on the alignment of the moon and Mars, it can be a six to nine month journey to the to Mars. Uh, the further out we go, the more of a time delay there is. So it's about 2.4 seconds on the moon. And depending on the alignment of uh, the Earth and Mars, it can be a six to 46 minute time delay. So now imagine that you're running a code on Mars. It is your crew physician that is coded and you suddenly need instruction. Do you have time to wait 46 minutes for instruction on how to perform compressions? Probably not. So to summarize, when we talk about the challenges of exploration class missions, we can refer to them as the big five. Altered gravity environments, distance from Earth, radiation, isolation environment, everything else, including altered day and night cycles and lunar regolith um, that falls under hostile environment. So now that I've adequately stressed you out, let's return to our initial question. You're the crew doctor. What are you going to pack now? So we've established the habit. Let's talk about the constraints of the environment as well as the tools we have at our disposal. So I know some of you in the audience may be engineers, so this should be no, uh, this should be a familiar site to you. This is a risk matrix. 
And so when we look at um, the NASA risk matrix in the context of risk mitigation, we look at how likely something's to happen versus how severe it is if it does happen. So for example, Eurosepsis, well, we know that uh, renal stone formation UTIs are a possibility in space. We know what happened in Apollo 13 with Fred Hayes, and we know that could be deleterious to the mission if it happens. So we need to be able to keep that with whether it's antibiotics, fluids, um, or in a, um, uh, maybe there's an advanced uh, protocol for, for lithotripsy. Um, so that would be something we need to mitigate. Whereas, you know, if something's very low risk um, and unlikely to happen, we don't worry about it. If something is high risk, but unlikely to happen, like a C-section in space, put your resources elsewhere. Risk mitigation starts at selection. And so this is why we have such rigorous selection when it comes to governmental space agency astronauts, CSA, NASA, and more. So folks have been disqualified for being iron deficiency anemic. They've been disqualified for a history of asymptomatic kidney stones, uh, herniated discs, because if those things happen in space, it is, uh, it is deleterious to the mission and deleterious to the crew. Um, this also applies and extends to not just medical and physiological factors, but psychological factors. So NASA applicants famously have to take a 600 question psychological battery, um, trying to screen out those subtle personality traits, personality disorders um, uh, that would impact crew dynamics in a negative way, because you don't want to send a sociopath to space, ideally not. Um, risk mitigation continues with monitoring countermeasures. Those who are well-versed in um, countermeasures on ISS know that, for example, to mitigate the bone loss and bone density loss and muscle atrophy that we talked about, Astronauts have to perform one and a half to two hours of resistive exercise as well as aerobic activity on station six days a week. Uh, we talked a little bit about nutrition earlier. So it's not just that the fluid has to be flavorable, flavorful and, and textured. It has to also be lightweight, have a long shelf life. It has, has to be nutritious and have a good bang for its calories. And um, it also has to be packaged differently. Oranges are a luxury on the ISS because they don't have that long shelf life, because they are um, they are dense, they are expensive, they are heavy. So those would be something that you would send up for Thanksgiving as a special treat. Um, quarantine is something we all now know because of COVID, but NASA was doing it before it was cool. So um, before flight, astronauts have to uh, quarantine um, for a period of weeks um, because we don't wanna bring infection up to station. Um, and then finally, there's the preventative, but there's also dealing with risks as they happen um, on station. So that comes with crew medical officer training, 40 hours for the CMO, as well as having an onboard medical kit, medication procedures. And how do we decide what to pack? Well, that's based on previous data of what happened in human spaceflight, um, what's most likely to be, what's most likely to happen, and what can be dealt with on station versus what cannot be. So other tools that we have at our disposal. So how do we how do we refine that further? So this is the uh, NASA integrated medical model. And it basically it takes data from previous space flights. And so what we can do is we can say, um, here's the crew profile, the crew is, here's how long the mission profile will be. Here's the data we have of incidents of different medical uh, pathologies from previous space flight. Here is the medical kit contents that we've had um, from previous uh, previous uh, medical kits. And then we extrapolate that to uh, acceptable levels of risk of loss of mission and loss of crew life. Uh, and then based on that, uh, generate the crew or the medical kit quantities and, and um, uh, equipment that we would need for a specific mission profile. So those of you who are following along with this may be thinking, well, what happens if you have six different events that happen over a mission and you've already exhausted your medical supplies with the first four events? This isn't very dynamic. I am glad you asked. So to help deal with that, we have the MedPrat or the Medical Extensible Dynamic Probability Risk Assessment Tool, which is why we call it the MedPrat because it is very cumbersome to say. And so this is based on Bayesian, Bayesian modeling and helps us um, determine mission outcomes based on X, Y, Z different events that happen at ABC different time points in um, a long emission timeline, generating outcomes one, two, three. So remember, translating that into English, it means that we have different, we can have a different 
outcome, say if we break an arm at the very outset on a on a mission to Mars, say we just left low Earth orbit and we an astronaut breaks an arm, that's going to have a different mission impact than say breaking your arm at the very end of a mission and you're on your way to rendezvous into low Earth orbit. Um, so that's why it's important to be able to have a dynamic and evolving um, way to predict what you'll need and how you'll prepare for space. So we talked about risk mitigation tools we have at our disposal, but also what has happened in spaceflight? Like, what do we need to bring with us? What is most likely to happen? So this is the exploration medical capability and IMM most likely things to happen in space. So everything from the terrifying cardiac arrest, how do we run a code in space, to everyday banal things like headaches uh, induced from congestion, from increased CO2 concentration, uh, to terrifying but mundane things like diarrhea in space. So this is based on data from um, previous uh, from previous space flight. And then the final part of the mission is knowing what our constraints are. So um, I know that Ben Easter previously talked to this group. He talked about the backpacking principle. Just to recap, it's if you're a hiker, everything that you bring with you on your hike or on your camping trip comes at the expense of something else. You can only bring fit so much into your volume, uh, into the volume of your backpack. And so it's very, it's, it's similar with space. I like to refer to this as the Aladdin principle because it takes phenomenal cosmic power to get to space. Itty bitty little bit. And so to summarize, anything that we bring with us has to be low cost, low mass, low volume, low power, easy to use and have a long shelf life. And so translating that into reality, here's a snapshot of some of the medical kits that they have on ISS right now. Notice that they're very compartmentalized, very um, efficiently packed, and that they're also easy to find. So procedural kits will be together, Medicaid kits will be together. Um, and so that's that's kind of a snapshot to spaceflight to date. But we kind of also talked about looking at the future. What happens when we go beyond the comforts, the comforts of uh, low Earth orbit? And so here is the NASA Human Research Roadmap and the risks that we can expect on exploration class missions. Everything from crew dynamics to radiation to dust exposure to skills deterioration. And the list goes on and on. And it's important to note that this list is dynamic. So risk can be retired or finding out more about one risk can honor the whole new host of problems. So to summarize, space is hard, space is expensive, and space is trying to kill us. So knowing this, how do we prepare for space? So here's another question for you. How do, what do the International Space Station, a remote rural village in Kenya, a Arctic deployment and the Aquarius Reef Base have in common? All of these are examples of environments that are in some way remote, resource limited, isolated and confined. And so these are analogous in some way to the International Space Station. And so we refer to any one of these as an environment. And so what do we learn from extreme and analog environments on Earth and why do they matter? Well, remember, space is high risk, space is expensive. You don't want the first time you use a piece of equipment or practice a protocol to be in space because that is setting yourself up for an expensive failure. So I'm gonna share with you some of my work from and lessons learned from various analog environments um, based on some of the work I've done. So let's start with micro and partial gravity. Um, so with POSSUM, so this is a citizen scientist astronautics uh, not-for-profit that uh, I I've, I've, uh, do work with and um, uh, direct the space medicine group for. So over six campaigns, we have run uh, parabolic flight campaigns to test the capabilities of an IVA or intervehicular activity suit. Um, and so the whole uh, premise is to increase the TRL or technology readiness level um, of this IVA suit through a, a subsequent um, uh, or increasingly um, uh, nuanced tests. So for example, the first year, we simply put a test suit in the subject or a test subject in the suit and uh, made sure there was nothing and they experienced no deleterious effects and the comfort level and motion of the suit. And then in subsequent campaigns, we pressurize the suit. We put the visor down, then we pressurize the suit. Then we said, can you um, perform fine motor um, movements on operating a, a dick um, on, uh, as you might ex be expected to do in, um, in a spacecraft? Um, so I can certainly keep on telling you about what the microgravity environment is like, but here's a quick video. Um, I'm just gonna unshare and then share because I don't 
don't think I quick uh, I shared the vol the volume on this. So one sec. Um, again. Share again. First of all, it's incredibly fun to be in a spacesuit in zero G. Highly recommend. It's impossible to not have a giant smile on your face. But more than that, you can also see the crew dynamics at play. We aren't just getting into a plane and flying. We are doing a, a we're all sitting around the table going through what we're going to do parabola by parabola. We're pre-briefing, then we're doing a dry run on the ground, then we're doing a dress rehearsal in the suit while the plane is grounded, then we fly our parabolas, and then we debrief. Um, around the table as one big group sharing lessons learned, what went right, what went wrong over each single parabola. So the next group can also learn from our mistakes. Um, so that's an example of some of the work we've done in parabolic flight. Uh, here's another example of a partial gravity analog. So this is work we did the, with the Canadian Space Agency. Here's an EVA extravehicular activity suit. Um, and I will acknowledge space and exploration are full of acronyms. My apologies for that. So in this, we were simulating um, three types of altered gravity environments, microgravity, lunar gravity, Martian gravity. And in this particular scenario with the suit, I was simulating, can I perform the fine motor movement work I would need to do to, for example, attach a panel, attach a hose to a panel outside the ISS. Um, so this is in the lunar rover yard um, uh, of the CSA. And uh, other work we did was we had redesigned tools based on lessons learned from Apollo for geology excursions. And then um, we had actually tested those tools in the field without an EVA suit, and then actually tested them in this EVA suit in simulated lunar gravity. Uh, so, yeah. oh, what was that? Oh, okay, I think that was an accident on mute. And so basically, we want, like we said, we don't want to make these expensive mistakes. We don't want to create a tool for the for the lunar environment and only test it for the first time on the moon, only to find that we had massive oversight. Uh, other examples of altered gravity environments, centrifuge studies. So this was um, in conjunction with the University of Texas Medical Branch. They were running centrifuge studies um, to simulate flight profiles you might see on suborbital flight with all manner of test subject, healthy, um, young, old, chronic conditions. Um, and basically me and some of my, my teammates got to be medical subjects, uh, test subjects in that. So that was incredibly uh, enlightening and fun. Um, water analogs. So what do we learn from water environments? So this is simulating IVA suit uh, interfacing uh, with post landing operation. Um, so in this case, we have a, a mock cup of the Orion capsule. You can see that over my right shoulder and we're assuming emergency egress operations. And basically we have to egress safely out of either the side hatch or the top hatch of this capsule. And then see how we're able to maneuver in the suit um, after deploying our portable flotation devices, um, pulling the seals on our suit and swimming over to that emergency raft, climbing off of it in our um, IVA suit. I learned the hard way. It's really important to pull the seals on your suit, lest it filled up, fill up with water. Otherwise, your task becomes monumentally harder. 
other analog environments from water, the water world. So living and working underwater. So this is the Neptune mission, uh, underwater aquanautic mission. I took part in in 2019, yet another acronym, sorry, Nautical Experiments in Physiology, Technology and Underwater Exploration. So as a crew of five, we lived and worked underwater at the Jules Undersea Lodge, 20 feet um, underwater, performing technology demonstrations. So I'll talk a little bit more about the work we did with VR. Underwater um, physiology, stress um, studies, uh, and more. And then some of you more may more famously know the Aquarius Reef Base, where NASA runs its NEMO missions, not um, NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations, where they send their astronauts and scientists in uh, crews of six for eight to 16 days to test crew dynamics, technology demonstrations, simulate EVAs. Um, and the beauty of a place like Aquarius being at 50 feet underwater is once you're in saturation, you cannot simply swim to the surface if there's a medical emergency, otherwise you risk an embolism or die of injury. To safely come out of saturation, you have to decompress for 15 hours and 47 minutes. So by comparison, if you had to hit the evacuation button on the ISS, the minimum time in which you can be at definitive medical care in Kazakhstan is 3.5 hours. So you could actually get to definitive medical care quicker from the ISS than you can from Aquarius. So coming to another type of analog environment, we talk about isolated and confined envir environments. I know there's many veterans of analogs here on the panel today. Um, and so the Mars Desert Research Station is amongst uh, many out there. There's high seas. Lunaris. And basically, this is an excellent test of crew operations, crew dynamics, because you are living and working as if you were on Mars, real life on fake Mars with your crew. You really want to be, um, you know, crew and mission oriented. Uh, when you suit up, when you go outside, you have to suit up because otherwise the Martian environment would kill you. Be to these amazing sprawling vistas. Um, and you also learn a lot about psychological resilience. And I won't spend too much time on this. I have an entire book chapter on this, but we know that folks who do well in austere environments, whether we're talking about ISS, Antarctica submarines, are those who adopt a um, positive psychology, salutogenic approach. These are people who view these austere confined environments as an opportunity to rise to the occasion. So operational environments, we don't have to necessarily actively simulate a specific aspect of the spaceflight environment. Just being in a environment like an aviation or research environment when things are changing on the dime really gives you that situational awareness as well as build your skills with crew resource management, crew dynamics. So here is a snapshot from our 2017 campaign in high level. So we were, um, uh, testing a new tomography uh, instrument. You can see that over my right shoulder to further delineate the three-dimensional structure of noctilucent clouds, a type of cloud thought to be related to climate change. We're flying an unpressurized aircraft, 19,000 feet. So really we're trying to make sure the tomography instrument is pointed where we need it to, it's calibrated, um, that our O2, that our oxygen is hooked up adequately. We're not showing signs of slow onset decompression um, and that we're, both maintaining the safety as well as the science of our mission. Resource limited environments. So um, this is one of my favorites. Um, so I'm the a chief instructor of the operational space medicine course for Project Possum. And basically we, sit, we challenge our participants who mostly come from a non-medical background. We have software engineers, pilots, military veterans. Um, and we challenge them to become a wilderness based medical MacGyver. And essentially say, in a resource limited environment, you're presented with this, um, this pathology, this trauma, how do you deal with it? And in stepwise fashion, teach them principles of assessment, triage, and treatment. And it's really cool to see that um, even from non-medical backgrounds, by simply building up in a very stepwise fashion and giving our students the fundamentals of, of um, wilderness triage, Everyone did amazingly, whether we threw at them night scenarios, polytraumas, mass casualty scenarios, um, you know, and they did phenomenally. So I couldn't end a section on analogs without a shameless plug for, for some of our members, Shana, Bonnie, Russia, uh, and more. So they just came out with a, uh, a paper, a seminal paper on safety and healthcare provision in space analogs there. 
Uh, maybe Shana, if you could throw that in the chat as well. Um, but there's a lot that we're still learning from analogs and I encourage you to, to uh, check out this paper. So in the last part of this talk, I wanna talk about the future of space medicine. So we've talked about how space is trying to kill us and the challenges of packing for space. So what we should ask ourselves, what is the gold standard? How can we make our lives easier, assuming we had no constraints? And the answer would simply be, assuming no constraints, assuming that resources were not a challenge, would be to simply terraform Mars. Think about it, bring back water, bring back oxygen and atmosphere, gravity, create a magnetosphere, boom, no radiation. Unfortunately, that is not the reality we live in, but it's an important question to ask because then it begs the question, well, what if we could not just meet the standard of care on Mars as we could for Earth, but what if we surpass that? How do we do that? We look to science fiction, we look to the future, and we look at how we can turn that into reality today. Maybe we could hack the system of uh, and over skip the risk of muscle and bone mass deterioration on a nine month journey to Mars by teleporting. Maybe we could skip that um, risk of the spaceflight environment by creating an artificial rotating gravity system like we see in Space Odyssey 2001 or the Martian. Maybe we overcome that decompensation by providing exoskeletons so the crew can provide, still perform meaningful work. Maybe we skip all that and simply send avatars of astronauts to Mars. Um, maybe we deal with the skills deterioration aspect by, as well as the mass volume power constraints by simply creating a matrix where we could upload skills to our brains. So this all sounds very sci-fi, but this is all happening today. So I promised you I would tell you um, a little bit more about the work that I'm doing in virtual reality. So here's a snapshot in that lower left-hand corner of some of the work I did on the Neptune mission. So I'm donning the VR headset and actually what I'm doing is I'm meeting the head of radiology in Saskatoon, Canada to review the complex comminuted scapular fracture of a simulated trauma patient in a virtual reality radiology room. And we're reviewing the imaging together. Um, and so that's an example of how we can use a technology that respects mass volume power constraints to um, overcome some of our challenges of space flight while also providing expert medical care. I'll skip the video in the interest of time, um, but we do this, um, this video is an example of the collaboration that we allow physicians to perform in the VR room. Um, here's another example of uh, some of the VR work that we're doing. So this is a project funded by the Canadian Space Agency. This is Caregiver. And we talked earlier about the risk of skills deterioration on the way to the moon or Mars. So imagine you're the crew medical officer. You've learned to put an IV in a patient on Earth nine months prior. The next time you're called upon that skill is on Mars. Nine months later, you've lost that skill set. Your patient looks like a pin cushion. What if you could practice your medical procedures in VR en route to Mars so you didn't lose that skill set? And that's what we're doing with caregiver. So we're, we're giving um, astronauts a way to um, practice their, their procedures, their lines, their intubation uh, without having to bring all of it with you. So we actually managed to test this not just underwater, but in zero G. So here's my crewmate, Heidi. Here is so Heidi on video. Look at me and wave. Amazing. Um, and that's just one example of how we're bringing science fiction into reality today. Here's a paper from the MIT Review talking uh, called Engineering Perfect Astronauts. And it may seem a little bit Gattaca, but they talk about, well, isn't it unethical to not genetically engineer an astronaut knowing that, that you're sending them into a high risk environment, high radiation, altered gravity, where they're at risk of deteriorating physiolog physiologically if you don't um, mitigate those risks. And so this isn't a, a sci-fi concept anymore. Here's data from the Mighty Mouse experiment that came back from ISS last September. And basically they sent up genetically engineered Mighty Mice, this jacked up little mouse you see on the left with increased bone mass and muscle mass. And then they introduced a muscle blockade in the ACBR2 receptor. And what they found is in the flown mice who were genetically engineered, they experienced less bone density loss. And then in some cases, um, increased bone muscle mass. So NASA is literally engineering Mighty Mouse. And the cool part of this is that this also has important re repercussions for folks with neuromuscular and degenerative diseases on Earth. So what other technologies can we look to to help us 
um, adapt to space. So coming back to science fiction, we have TARS, we have HAL 9000. So what if we could leverage the power of machine learning and AI to help the sole crew physician with diagnostics uh, on Mars? Remember, our job as physicians isn't to memorize every single aspect of medicine, especially when medicine and guidelines are changing so frequently, when pathologies like COVID are emerging. It's to use the best available data as well as the technologies at our disposal to do right by our patients. What other technologies are out there? 3D printing, additive manufacturing. Remember, if we're resource limited, why not just bring the core components we need to print critical tools or even tissues with us and then print it in space? Um, I talked earlier about the sci-fi aspect of creating an artificial gravity spa rotating space station. Well, that's what we're doing with orbital assembly. We're building uncrewed and eventually crewed rotating gra artificial gravity platforms to help mitigate those deleter deleterious effects of uh, long-term um, exposure to microgravity. What about something even more sci-fi like human hibernation? Well, ESA conducted a study on that too. And they found that by having a crew hibernate for the majority of a, of a trip to Mars and awakening the crew two to three weeks ahead of arriving on Mars, they could actually save on one third the volume cost of a space capsule. What if we just hacked the system and just made the trip shorter altogether? Well, we may not have teleportation, but here's a proposal for the Vasimir plasma engine to get from Earth to Mars in not just six months or nine months, but in 39 days. Remember, we start to see the long-term effects of uh, altered gravity, microgravity in 30 days. So if we're shortening the time that we're exposed to microgravity, that's one way to, to uh, mitigate risk. So the bottom line is we're going to have to science the space out of this if we're hoping to send humans to Moon and Mars and beyond in a way that keeps leads them not to surviving, but thriving and performing meaningful work, along with a little bit of space MacGyvery. So I'm going to wrap it up here in the next two minutes, and then we'll get to your questions. So here are the questions when we talk about looking at the future that keep me up at night. So we still have to delineate the gravity prescription. And so what we mean by this is how much gravity is enough at what frequency um, and for what uh, duration to mitigate all of these deleterious effects that we talked about. How does crew selection change for Mars knowing that a mission profile could be on the order of years, not just months? And how self-sufficient do they need to be? So I love this case study and I apologize for not warning you about the graphic image. The this is Leonid Rogozov. He was a Soviet physician in an Antarctic base in 1961, tried to ignore his right lower quadrant pain uh, for days, tried treating with antibiotics, and then finally came to the sad conclusion that, hey, I have appendicitis and I'm the only doctor on station. And so here's him performing his own auto appendectomy. Um, and so then that begs the question, should we send crews to Mars telling them, hey, you may have to take out your own appendix, or should we prophylactically remove their appendices before they ever go uh, far away from an OR. And so here's a paper from 2012 by a lot of famous names in the field, some former NASA um, flight surgeons, former astronauts, um, discussing the risks and benefits of prophylactic surgery. Um, and there's precedent on Earth for this. Um, so we know that, um, for example, Via Las Estrellas is a Chilean uh, Antarctic settlement that is so far hundreds of miles away from surgical care that anyone over the age of six needs to have a prophylactic appendectomy to be approved to live there. Um, other questions is how do we build a habitat that is radiation safe? There are some out there who propose that, well, there's no amount of shielding that would be cost efficient enough to bring with you that would justify an above ground habitat and that you would actually need to build your habitat under meters of regolith. The food issue. So there's the, the NASA Decadal Survey that looks at challenges in space biology and human life sciences. One of the challenges with space. Um, so I think I mentioned in my um, introductory slide, I'm a medical advisor to Mission Space Food in Astrias. And the problem with space or with food is that its shelf life right now is three years. So either we have to plan on a lot of resupply from ours or we need to re-engineer our food to have a better shelf life while maintaining the standards for nutrition um, and mass and volume constraints. So we're ch changing the nature of the work we do when we go to the moon and beyond. Our EVAs are no longer spacewalks in microgravity. We're performing EVAs in 17 to 38% gravity in a 
dusty, um, steep terrain. So the potential for trauma increases. So how do our medical capabilities change along with that? And what models do we use from Earth, whether it's military deployments, refugee camps, or even ISS models to build up permanent lunar capabilities? And in what fashion do we build that up from our current capabilities of first aid kits, stabilize and evacuate to Earth on ISS to eventually building up permanent capabilities, including a surgical suite and life support um, systems on the moon and beyond. Um, what, knowing our mass and volume constraints, how do we construct that trauma bay on Mars? And what I think would be really cool is if we, we could start graduating physicians with specialty in moon or Mars medicine. Um, and related to that is right now is how far do we go? So this is a member, this is a paper on CPR guidelines from the European Space Society of Aerospace Medicine, looking at what we know on performing CPR in space. And very pertinently, they asked the question as well, how far do we go? If we ended up having cardiac arrest on the moon and performed um, CPR and then had return to spontaneous circulation, well, what happens next? We do, if we don't, you know, how do we engage in the futility or how do we justify engaging in CPR um, knowing that it's futile if we don't have the life support capabilities to keep the patient on life support on the moon? So there's a lot of questions we need to answer going forward. And of course, in the era of COVID-19, we couldn't get away without asking, how would we handle the first moondemic? So knowing that gravity is one sixth of what it is on the moon versus Earth, does social distancing suddenly extend to 36 feet on the moon? We also have to talk about the space birds and the space bees. So if Elon Musk is serious about um, creating not just you're not just sending humans to Mars, but creating permanent off-world settlements. Well, that implies um, procreation off-world. And so we have a lot of conflicting data from wasps, jellyfish, zebrafish, mice, rats, and more. We don't know how that translates to humans. And at best, the data is conflicting. So we need a lot more data in an ethical fashion before we can seriously talk about creating permanent off-world human settlements. And then coming back to that initial question that I asked is maintaining the standard of care on Mars, but also surpassing that. So does that mean that we have to create an analogous body to the World Health Organization, like a galactic health organization? And how do we govern that knowing the distance is involved? And then one of my favorite questions is once we reach to Mars, where do we go to next? So in the last 30 seconds here, let's bring it back to Earth. This is an incredible time in space life. We are democratizing access to space. We see the rise of announcements like the Inspiration4 mission. Um, Axiom has partnered with Discovery Channel um, to send a crew of civilian astronauts to space. We see the rise of the Dear Moon mission. The European Space Agency has just announced um, the call for para-astronauts. Um, Stephen Hawking famously flew microgravity uh, in 2009. Um, this is a literature review we put, we um, performed on, or we completed on medical guidelines for commercial space flight. And so space democrat democratization is happening. And we have a few more questions about uh, uh, the medical implications along with that. So final question I want to ask is, how do we bring these benefits of all these challenges back to Earth? We talked about resource remote, isolated, confined, um, resource limited environment. And it's not just space, it's rural medicine. As someone who practices 80% rural ER, I can tell you there are very real challenges of not being in a tertiary care center. So how do we bring these technologies, whether it's handheld ultrasound, um, ISS, iodine, resin filters, um, solar powered refrigerators, um, back to resource limited communities on earth. Um, and these are all examples life spin-offs that have come back to earth to bring that benefit to earth. So this is my very long-winded way of saying is that there are a lot of challenges that we need to solve when it comes to medicine in a severe environment in space life, as well as on earth and there is no shortage of questions to ask and so if you're interested this is your time to be part of space flight and it starts with you and it starts with a single step. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm really excited to get to your questions. And then finally, 
I've also included a list of resources that have helped me through my career. Um, so I'll make sure that I send that out to you because I know that um, a lot of you will be interested in seeing these resources. So over to you for questions. All right, we already have some really great questions set up in the chat. I'm gonna hand it over to Melissa to curate the chat. Again, if this is your first time being with us, the way that we do it is Dr. Jordan will call on, your, call on you to ask your question. If you cannot ask your question, it's not a good environment, you don't have the bandwidth, that's fine. Just ask us to read it off for you and we will do that. The recording is still on. You are free to turn your video on, but it may make you a star. All right, here we go. All right, so first question that we had was from Salman. Um, their question was, what do you think about the prospects or practicality of 3D bioprinting based approaches in space or during colonization, like cancer mediated skeletal muscle loss, organ damage, tissue damage, etc. Are you present? Do you want to <laughs> talk on and, and, and interact with Dr. Fanja? Um, Salman had said that they had a bad connection, so they asked that I read the question for them. Sure. So the question is, how realistic is um, 3D printing and additive manufacturing in space? It, it is getting there. And so um, Made in Space was the first to do off-world printing on ISS. Uh, and now, um, although they're, they're being a little bit quiet about it, I've talked to researchers both in the commercial sector as well as in the research sector looking at new methods for manufacturing. Um, looking at new materials for off-world manufacturing with the view to applying this towards pharmaceuticals, uh, towards materials manufacturing. And then the other cool part is that we're looking at bringing these benefits back to earth. So some things that we can use off-world manufacturing for are fiber optics, pharmaceuticals, semiconductors. Um, I think there was a space medicine component to your question as well. Let me just scroll down to it. Um, and so the thing that you do touch on something important is, well, how Okay, that's cool. That's useful. But how, what source material do we need to bring on? How will that change in altered gravity? How is radiation going to impact um, the, the scaffold, the structural integrity, the, the shelf life of that? So the short answer is we don't know, but we, that is a great question that needs to be answered. And, um, I, you know, I'm so excited to see what comes of uh, 3D printing in space. Perfect, thank you very much, Shauna. Um, our next question comes from Inakshi. Inakshi, are you available? Yes, I can read. Oh, perfect, you can go ahead and read your question. Uh, actually, my question was that uh, I'm an undergraduate student, medical student mm -hmm. from India. Uh, I want to pursue my career in space medicine. And from my early childhood, I've been dreaming about being an astronaut. So uh, I just want uh, a guide for this career. How can I pursue this career? That's um, a really great question. And you're certainly in the right place to be asking that question. And so um, there's part of it is country dependent. So for example, in, in the US and the UK, there's wonderful opportunities for doing fellowships and further training in aerospace medicine. In Canada, for example, um, really the route, the main route is through the military. You can get a six month area of focused competency in, in aerospace, but it's not um, it's the same as the aerospace fellowship. That being said, um, the beauty of the aerospace and austere environment world is um, how many opportunities for collaboration and research and connectivity there are. And so asthma, um, so the first step is making those connections. So being a part of a, group, of a group like WAM, coming to the asthma conferences, going to um, the World Extreme Medicine Conference, going to the International Astronautical Congress. Um, those are all really good ways to start getting your feet wet. And to kind of give you a concrete example of how that impacted me is, I wrote a paper on telemedicine for my first International Astronautical Congress um, in Hyderabad in 2007, actually. And then someone saw that and said, hey, I'm creating an anthology on, on space medicine for Earth. Would you be willing to turn that into a book chapter? And as a medical student, I was able to write a book chapter um, on that contributed to space medicine for Earth um, by simply attending a conference. 
So the the first, um, I think you're on the right track by by starting to reach out and look for opportunities and attend gatherings like WEM. Okay, ma'am, thank you so much. Thanks. And then that actually, um, you had a couple of questions that I saw in the chat. Did you want to ask those other questions too, Anakshi? Uh, okay. I was asking about suspended animation, uh, the hibernation actually. So how can it come, come to reality and uh, help us in case of long-term and deep space missions, like the mission yeah. to Mars, which can what take a, uh, months? What a great question. And so, like I said in the talk, like if you think it's science fiction, odds are someone is working on it today. So there have been, um, companies and research institutes who are seriously looking at translating hibernation models in hibernating species to non-hibernating species. So the challenge right now is humans don't hibernate as much as we would love to in the minus 40 Canadian winter. We don't get to do that. We still have to get up and go out to work. Um, but for example, the Alaska Institute of Biology, what they've done is they've developed a model looking at the ground squirrel, which does hibernate, and in doing so, decreases its metabolism by 99%. They said, well, how can we do that in a non-hibernating species like a rat? And they've actually gotten the rat to hibernate, but there's a challenge in that it also makes the rat more prone to gut perforation, which not acceptable, not ideal for humans to Mars. And so there is potential. So, so the benefit would be less, you know, um, Less users, less resource utilization, less mass, loss volume needs, less supplies, kinds of time, uh, less chance for um, crew um, dynamic, interdynamics, and and conflict. Um, but the challenge is, we need to be able to safely replicate that model, and people are working on that. Um, so who knows? It may be it may be a part of, of long duration space flight in the future. But it's it's it blows my mind that it's been work it's being worked on in this day and age. And my another question was uh, that uh, how the long-term missions can affect the psychology of an astronaut? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think if you, in my experience, if you ask um, a dozen space flight experts, you get a dozen different answers. And so I've heard everything from, well, it's not gonna change the selection process that much because we already select for crew-oriented, mission-oriented, um, uh, astronauts who have good interpersonal dynamics. And um, this is just an extended version of that. But on the flip side is every everyone is human at the end of the day, everyone has their limits. And so when you are taking them away from their creature comforts, whether it's their family, their dog, their Starbucks for five years, you know, what is their limit? And, um, you know, when does something become, you know, that was tolerable on earth, whether it's the way you're crewmate coughs or snores or breathes, when does that become intolerable? So in my estimation, I would say that we would be prudent to look at those models again and say, how does this need to change and be optimized for success if you're looking at a three to five year mission profile? And how would it feel uh, like in long-term space missions, how did it feel to be alone in the vast universe on the way to Mars? How did it feel to uh, be alone on this whole journey? That's an interesting question. So, so Michael Collins, when he was the pilot of um, uh, on the Apollo 11 mission, you know, he's been erroneously called the loneliest man um, in you know the universe because it was just him. His crewmates were on the moon, and everyone else was back on Earth. Um, he was. He admitted that he was physically lonely, but he didn't. Um, feel the despair of that loneliness and so the question is well that was a short short period of time compared to, to what you're talking about for mars so what how do you address what contributes to loneliness for example being away from those relationships you have on earth um how do you mitigate that whether it's through human hibernation or um bringing immersive technologies like vr and augmented reality to bring back some of those creature comforts so um, there's a lot of questions to be answered about the limits of human loneliness, um, but it's critical to be addressing them now because we don't want to be surprised by that on Mars. 
Yes. Thank you so much, ma'am. All right. And then we have a question from Victoria Tucci. Are you available, Victoria? Yeah, I am. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Pandia, for the amazing talk. I learned so much. Um, I was just wondering, when prescribing medication, like antibiotics, for example, um, in space, is there a dosing difference to account for the difference in glomerular filtration rate in microgravity? That's a great question. To from everything that I've seen that we just use standard dosing, but we need to know, well, what is the shelf life of Keflex or Cipro on station? Um, how is that affected by altered gravity? Um, how is that affected by um, radiation? Uh, and if there are shelf life limits, can we print that in situ? And then also if you're manufacturing off world, uh, is that advantageous because we have ad advantages when it comes to crystal formation or is it just gonna change the, um, uh, the molecular structure altogether. So those are the limits of my knowledge. If someone else knows more about pharmaceuticals, um, please feel free to chime in. But uh, there are, my, on my understanding is there's questions that we need to answer about longer duration shelf life. So Thank you so good. much. Yeah, there's, there is a study done on actually uptake, metabolism, and kinematics of acetaminophen, ground versus space. So they, you know, they gave astronauts Tylenol, or paracetamol for those of you who are not in the US, uh, and then tested the blood level concentrations after the oral dose on the ground, sent them up and did it again in space. The blood level concentrations did not reach the concentrations that they reached on the ground. Okay, why? Interesting question. Uh, might have to do with uh, liver metabolism. So uh, you know, APAP, acetaminophen, um, is metabolized by the liver in several passes through cytochrome P450. Is cytochrome P450 less efficient? Uh, was there less absorption through the mouth? You know, exactly what was going on there. But we actually are assuming that there is not only a difference in shelf life, but a difference in uh, metabolic processing, at least of drugs that go through the cytochrome P450 system. Kidney, glomerular filtration rate might also come into it for those that are uh, kidney and renal uh, excreted eliminated. So great question. And the answer is the jury is out, but there are definitely some differences. Wow, that's so interesting. Thank you so much. Um, and I just had one more quick question. I'm just wondering, I'm based in Canada. Um, do you know if in order to pursue space medicine and to become a flight surgeon, um, would I have to do a medical res residency in another specialty first and then pursue uh, space medicine after that? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is actually kind of the beauty of um, having um, uh, aerospace be restricted to military in Canada is that if you can show that you're operationally good, competent, make tough decisions, um, you actually do have a path to being a flight surgeon without pursuing aerospace. So for example, Rob Riddell, one of the CSA flight surgeons has a fascinating background. He's an ER doc, but before that he was a medic with special forces JTF too, which is an extremely relevant operational background. Um, so that's, you know, there's, there's many paths to aerospace in Canada. Like there, I have not pursued any formal aerospace training. It's just that I love the research. I love the field. Um, and so there's ways to contribute to, um, to the research um, through austere environment research and operation. Um, so other, so you do, the short answer is you should uh, pursue clinical training in the field of, field of your interest. Translating that to our colleagues at NASA, they still have urologists, neurologists, psychiatrists, internal internists. Like there's no one path to aerospace medicine. Um, and then in Canada, when we look towards civilian path towards aerospace, the Royal College has a six month um, area of focused competency, AFC, that you can do once you've hit the two year mark in practice, you're able to complete while you're in clinical practice. Um, and then I believe Dr. Joan Sari, who's like just a legend in aerospace um, uh, and space medicine in Canada is working to create a two-year fellowship program. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully that will come through. Thank you so much. I'm actually doing a couple of research projects with Dr. Sari too. So um, I'll ask her more about that. Thank you so much. She's awesome, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure, thank you. And then next up in the chat box, we had a question from Sophie. Sophie, are you available? Yes. 
Perfect, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sophie, I'm from Germany. Um, thank you for this super nice talk. I thought it was really well-rounded and I've never seen anyone put so many different topics in one hour and still make it so interesting. So this is awesome, thank you. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, it's not like space, but about you, your master's at ISU and whether that would help a doctor aspiring to work in space medicine at all in the career and also about Project Possum. I'm new to this, I don't know much. So how did you get there and what did you do with them? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And thanks for bringing it up because I only realized um, when I when one of the uh, WEM members I saw nearby was an ISC grad, I thought, oh my gosh, I didn't even mention that. But that, that really was where I got my start because um, once I finished my degree in neuroscience, I thought, well, you know, what if I don't get into medicine? Um, let's, what's something I'm also passionate about that I want to apply to? Um, and this, this was kind of like that fork in the road somewhere in a parallel universe. There's a Shauna who took a different decision, but I was lucky enough to get into both med school as well as the master's program at ISU and then realized that I didn't want to give up that space dream and space dream of a space career. And for me, that's, that's exactly where I got my start because the master's is a very this interdisciplinary broad level program. It's meant for engineers, it's meant for policymakers. There's, you know, lectures on space policy, engineering, astrobiology, space medicine. And then with the master's program, keep in mind that this data is from 2007, but some of it's still relevant, is you get to do a three month internship in a field of your choice. And so um, it was suggested to me to look into the crew medical support office at the European Astronaut Center. So I'm not sure in where in, in Germany you are, but this is just outside of Cologne. Um, this is in Cologne, so I know yeah, that. and so there was, it was just such an amazing environment. It was so like I got to work alongside the flight surgeons and biomedical engineers and create a quick reference guide for the hazards to the autonomous transfer vehicle, which is a brand new vehicle at that time and contribute meaningfully to operational space medicine. Um, so that was one way in which I realized that, hey, this can actually be part of your career. Um, and then everything that stemmed from that, that paper that I wrote on telemedicine, um, papers I worked with the team project, those all stemmed from my experience at ISU. Then I went to ISC, that's where the book chapter came from. And then that summary of experiences also built up the, the space resume to actually be qualified enough to complete the aerospace medicine elective and NASA's Johnson Space Center. So um, my personal experience was like ISD was start, um, you know, the, the friendships, the networks, the, you know, the opportunities were, were incredible. So um, yeah, I, I, I'm all for ISU. And then the second part of that question is Project Possum. So um, yeah, sorry, I didn't explain what it was, but so it's a citizen scientist uh, bioastro bioastronautics not-for-profit. The initial mandate started with um, taking citizen scientists up in suborbital craft to study noctilucent clouds in the upper mesosphere, which are thought to be related to climate change. Um, well, so this was in 2015 before there were really any suborbital flight opportunities. Uh, and really right now, suborbital flight is emerging, but there are no citizen scientist opportunities. But despite that, we've seen tremendous opportunities in IVA, EVA spacesuit testing, um, the, the people who come to Possum are just so incredibly qualified. You know, they've been top 20, top 120, top 60 in the CSA NASA selections. Um, so they're experts in uh, expedition, um, uh, citizen science, planetary geology. And so now we cover everything from operational space medicine, which is a course I teach, to uh, life sciences and life support systems, to orbital mechanics. Um, so to apply for Possum, you have to do the ground school. We request that folks have a degree in a STEM field, scuba diving license, and then a pilot's license is nice to have but not need to have. If you don't have that background in the STEM field, you can still complete ground, through, ground school through the Possum Academy. Um, and then that opens you up to all of the other courses, whether it's the parabolic flight campaigns, the uh, EVA suit testing, um, and that's kind of the broad overview. I can throw the link into the chat. Um, our operations have been on hold because of COVID. So we've been doing the just online uh, school components like the flight test engineering, uh, orbital mechanics. Um, but I've been involved for almost six years now, which is crazy to say, and it's been incredible. Oh, thank you. Were you a participant or a teacher? Oh, yeah, sorry. That's, yeah, sorry. That's, um, 
I started, so I applied as a, um, to the ground school in 2015. I completed the ground school and then I just was blown away by my experience and attended every single course they had to offer, whether it was the post-flight post, post water egress operations, the, the um, parabolic flight. And then I was asked to put together a course on operational space medicine, which is where I came as an instructor. And then as we got, as we built, we became more multinational. So we, we have students from all across the world. There were more mm -hmm. folks with medical backgrounds. We built our space medicine group saying, hey, we have access to all of these incredible analog environments. How do we leverage these to address questions and challenges in space flight? So that's where um, the role as the director of the space medicine group came in. Thank you so much for the elaborate answer. <laughs> Perfect. And then we have some other um, kind of more specific um, medical questions in the space environment. Um, let's see. Uh, Katya, Katya Yani, are you available? I can yes. ask. Oh, perfect. Uh, Go ahead, Katya. Hello, Matt. Hello. Hi, Katya Yani. How are you? I'm great. Great to see you. Thank you. I'm so happy to see you. It's really, really <laughs> nice to connect with you. Uh, so my question is that uh, how vitamin D deficiency affects the body of an astronaut uh, when they are in space and uh, uh, how its deficiency can be overcome? Okay, that's a great question. And so we know that vitamin D is implicated in uh, bone health and bone metabolism. So even for osteoporotic states um, on earth, you know, calcium, vitamin D would be the, as well as exercise and a complete diet would be the initial steps. And then we would add something like a bisphosphonate. Um, so now translating that to bone health. Um, so vitamin D is very, innocuous it's very it's very harmless um i don't remember what they're doing for bone health right now i believe there was talk of introducing bisphosphonate um so i don't recall if vi vitamin d is part of the supplementation for astronauts on station um but i can't see why it wouldn't be but if anyone can chime in here um to comment on vitamin d Sure, I can. Actually, Katayani, your question is very timely. Just about a month and a half ago, the human health countermeasures element, who is responsible for tracking things like this at NASA, posted their report. Um, they have been supplementing with 400 units a week on ISS, uh, vitamin D, and then measuring ground versus space. Um, and they found that despite a 400 IU weekly supplementation, after uh, microgravity exposure, people were still coming back with 25 less vitamin D, percent less vitamin D, serum vitamin D than when they went. Uh, I can get that link up if you'd like. So that's a fairly recent finding. Now, of course, you have to ask yourself, why 400 units? I supplement my spinal cord injury patients who are effectively the earthbound analogs of people in space. They are offloaded. They don't load their axial skeletons. Many of them do not walk, or if they walk, they, they don't ambulate the way most of us do freely. They have to use devices and they aren't spending as much time upright. I supplement them with 400 IU a day. <laughs> you know, white people or people who are living indoors, uh, not getting sun exposure. You know, we're only one of two mammals that can make their own vitamin D. Most, most every animal has to ingest it. Um, but if you're not getting a uh, direct UV exposure, you won't make it anyway, not from your cholesterol. So you have to ingest it. Most of us take 400 units a day on earth. Um, so that's it. They, they were using fairly low doses. So we have to bear that in mind. But so far it looks like either we're not we're not absorbing it from our gut, which is a problem in space. So even though there's plenty of it, we're not absorbing it, or that's simply not enough because the excretion is outpacing our absorption, or both could be true. So um, we're working on it is the answer and keep asking those questions because that's a great question. And that's, thank you. That's, uh, awesome. Thank you for that. So I was just looking around on my desk because I actually keep my vitamin D next to my computer. So I remember to take it. I in Canada, 
we're so northern and so deficient. I supplement and encourage my patients to supplement with 2,000 units daily. Um, and then in a, um, I once worked in a refugee clinic where you know we would see rickets all the time. We would see the issues with dark, uh, absorption and darker skin that uh, Shana had alluded to, and we would prescribe them you know thousands of units at a time. I think something like a hundred thousand units uh, per week. So um, uh, it's you know the dosage does change, but yeah, that's thanks for bringing my attention to that that paper. I would love to take a look at it. All right, and then I only see one more question in the chat uh, from Smith. Are you available? Oh uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. I am here. Perfect. Uh, you can so, read your question if you'd like. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to ask that. Um, how can I get into space medicine research career? I mean, I I already completed bachelor's of science in pharmacy. Uh, so uh, what shall I do next in order to pursue my career in space medicine research? Yeah, that's a great question. And so the beautiful thing about this field is, is a couple of things. The people who are interested in aerospace and space medicine are the most excited, passionate, brilliant, and welcoming people that you'll, you'll meet. Um, and this group is no exception. And then the second part is there's no shortage of questions to answer. And so the beauty of living in a time like this where we're so virtually connected is there's so many groups out there that are conducting good research. So um, our colleagues at Space Generation Advisory Council, I know Rochelle um, uh, is the life sciences lead and there's a few others involved with that. They run, um, they do amazing research, have research groups, research papers. Um, I'm the life sciences team lead um, for the Association of Space Flight Professionals. That's where we published the literature review on medical guidelines for commercial space flight. Um, I see there's more than a few ISU alum in the chat. Um, so if you want to pursue a more formal um, education, um, some of the team projects um, focus on life sciences and space medicine. Um, so there's more than a few ways. There's the there's various groups out of asthma. So in addition to the women in aerospace group, there's a space medicine association group. Um, so there's that's you know there's there's lots of different groups and figure out you know figure out which one you like, which one you're comfortable with, um, what you want to contribute to, um, because there's there's many welcoming groups out there. And then um, space uh, sorry students for the exploration and development of space. There's many chapters across the globe. There's Canadian chapters, Indian chapters, UK, US chapters. Um, so I will, I have um, those, all of the resources and more that I've alluded to on a link. I can certainly post them in the chat right now um, for, for anyone who wants to look at opportunities in space. It may be a bit more CSA ESA centric, but there's definitely US opportunities in there as well. So give me a second, I'll post that. Perfect. Thank you very much, Shauna. Now, that's a kind of a big question that we get a lot is a lot of people are looking for involvement or next steps for us. Um, so I really appreciate you taking the time to help kind of connect people with those links. Um, that's like one of our Thank one you. of our biggest like recurring questions. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think you know, quickly flash up that um, that those two slides just so everyone knows what that will take you to. Give me one sec here. I briefly, briefly flashed this up. Um, so basically anything related to space, whether it's ISU, IAC, the UTMB, PASM course, whether you're interested in dive medicine, um, different uh, societies, wilderness medicine, like these are places where I got my start, where I continue to have links, um, anything related to austere environment medicine. So I encourage you to look at these links. Um, and then if you wanna send me a okay. message, if you feel that there's any thing feel free to share it. Uh, I, I have one more question. Um, so um, if, if I did a theoretical research by myself on any space medicine topic, a particular topic, and later I want to uh, like write that, uh, that research article and publish it. So do I need to be affiliated with any university or college in order to publish that thing? The, it helps. It helps to work with folks who are established um, because then you're not reinventing the wheel. 
Um, and, you know, you may gain a new affiliation. And then just everything in space is so team-based and so collegial. Uh, it, you know, you're, as someone who wrote their first book chapter on their own and then had co-authors for the next two, it just helps with the workload. It helps build your own knowledge. It, it helps saving you from redoing a lot of work. So I'd encourage you to 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 publish with um, yeah, any other with author. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. And I'd like to encourage everybody who's able to and wants to apply for the NASA postdoctoral program. You can be a U.S. citizen, a green card holder, someone on the J-1 visa, or, and I put in the link, uh, for nationals, asylees, or refugees at the time of application who are pending uh, some of those statuses. So don't let a pending a status, if you're an asylum seeker, stop you. You know, there are provisions have been put in place because we understand people cannot travel due to COVID and other issues. So if you're interested in pursuing research as a career, please, you know, see if you see if you can fit into one of these categories and see if you can apply to the NASA postdoctoral programs. Maybe you can find out, I mean, now the current standard is, I'm sorry, I miswrote it, 800 to 2000 IU of vitamin D should be enough for three to six months. But what about beyond three to six months? Maybe that's the question you want to help answer. If that's something you want to pursue, you know there are people working on that at NASA. So come on down, see who's doing that work, reach out to that segment or those the group of people who are publishing in that area, your area of interest, and find out if they can help sponsor you for a postdoctoral position. Right, and then um, I don't see any more questions in the chat, so this will be our kind of last chance for the Q&A if there's anybody else who has any burning questions you'd like to ask Dr. Pandya while we have her here. Well, then I will turn the floor back over to Shana. I have completed the question session. Um, if you guys have anything else, please, please feel free to reach out to us via email. Um, we can always try to help you reconnect or to help answer questions for you as well. Um, we have our uh, contact email. I can put it in the chat box for you just in case you don't have it yet. We also have Women in Aerospace Medicine Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. So you'll be able to reach out to us and we can help point you in the direction if you do have questions later for people. Melly, would you like to drop the membership survey in the box? And I can drop the membership survey in the box. Oh, so, so as I was seriously typing over here, um, <laughs> we put a survey together really quickly for you. We did. Um, it's you. just to get a, as, as Shana had alluded to in the beginning, we want to know kind of where you guys are at um, in your careers, what you're looking for from WAM, uh, what we can do to help connect you and what we're doing right now that you like and what we can do that you would like to see still. So we put a survey together for you all, and I will go ahead and paste that in the chat box for you right now. So you guys will be the very first people to see it. Um, and then um, we'll go ahead and use those responses to kind of guide where we're going in the future for WAM as well. Let's see if I still have it copied. If you are coming in person to asthma, please let us know so we can get a room big enough for the um, dance party. I mean, um, <laughs> I mean, meeting, very serious meeting that we will be having there. Um, and for people who cannot be physically present, we will make sure to have cameras up and have everyone up and as many people as we can get who were speakers. So far, it's been an amazing year for speakers. We'll get them in the room if they're at asthma. And if not, we'll get some people in the room uh, who we want to be speakers for us. And you guys can all say hi, okay? Shauna, are you coming to, uh, to WAM this year? I don't know how your travel schedule is gonna work out. August is a tricky time. I thought it was delayed now, was it not? With the asthma? Uh, are we going, is it, it, I thought it was August, September still this year. Is it going to be as late as October? Because it gets, the weather gets really bad in Denver. Yeah, let me, to be, to be determined, uh, depending on what the variants are doing in Canada, we're, we're struggling. <laughs> I know it's so tough, but they just sent out the questionnaires. August 29th is September 3rd uh, in Denver, Colorado is when they want us to show up. So before it starts snowing. 
basically. Okay, I will I will keep an eye out for that, and uh, hopefully we get to see Hulk smash in person together. Okay. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. This will be on YouTube. Thanks for your participation. Thank you for filling out your membership survey. Everybody, we'll see you soon. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Shauna. Great to see you as always. Thanks for taking the time. Bye everyone. Good night everyone. Thank you, mom. Thank you everyone.